All right, next I would like to introduce our speaker today. Ann Reed is from the class of 2017. Uh, she is one of our regular help desk gurus. So if you're emailing the help desk, you might hear back from Ann. Um, she's also one of our local seed distributors. The Master Gardeners have continued to um, hand out seeds during this kind of time when seeds can be hard to find. So Ann is someone who really stepped forward to help with that part of our, um, our process this year. And additionally, she's on our board of directors and she's our um, demonstration garden liaison. So welcome, Ann, and we're excited to, to have you speaking for us today. Thank you, Leslie. It's wonderful to be here and it's all so wonderful to share uh, information about container gardening. The focus, of course, is on planting and nurturing an outdoor container garden. The information that I'm going to share with you this morning is based on current best practices studied by Virginia Co Cooperative Extension and other extension services, as well, reputable website and notable books have contributed to this presentation. The premise this morning is with appropriate containers and proper care, anything that can be grown in the ground can also be grown in a container. You will often find me repeating best management practices in different contexts. And I do this due to the impact that they have on plant health. Uh, who are we Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia? We're 223 strong and we have been doing this thing since 1985. Um, the help desk where I spend a lot of time is available online at that uh, address, mgarlex at gmail.com. The plant clinics are um, open, not open because of COVID. When they are, there's one located at the courthouse on Saturday in Arlington, Central Library in Arlington on Wednesday evenings, and in Alexandria and Del Rey on Saturdays. Our demonstration gardens are absolutely beautiful. Uh, the Glen Carlin Community Garden, the Organic Vegetable Garden, Sunny and Forest Shade in Arlington, and Simpson Park in Alexandria. MGNV.org is a masterpiece. It has incredible resources for gardening best practices, lots of ideas and resources. One of the best things about the Virginia Extension Service is its soil entomology and pathology labs which are available to the public. This is our agenda and our goal is to discuss some uh, various types of topics that relate to container basics. Um, we will uh, include the best management practices. We will also um, include several trends that have been going on happily in 2021. And some of those trends involve growing shade plants in containers, uh, nurturing tree fruits, a little bit about roses, my favorite porch pots, a little more expansion on vegetable gardening, and some fun things with carnivorous bogs. You will find that on the trends, I don't go into as much detail because some of them could be treated as a separate topic entirely. That is why I included the resource page and the information that you can benefit from. So for details, I would refer you to the resource page. One of my favorite pictures of uh, a tiger fall, uh, swallowtail uh, on my globe amaranth last summer. It is important sometimes to determine your purpose, particularly if you have small spaces to deal with. You might want to try something new, uh, like plant roses in containers. Um, you might want to think about uh, what you want to accomplish. Do you want to uh, do this with your children? Do you want to grow just herbs? Do you want to have some privacy by using uh, shrubs or trees? You want to have a focal point or accent your landscape. Do you want to have a different look for each season? Maybe some bulbs for spring, uh, zinnias and daisies for summer mums and gourds for fall and those woody plants and evergreens for winter. You can also plan for a permanent uh, plant in the center like an evergreen of some sort and add seasonal uh, additions to it. 
I won't go through a lot of the growing advantages because uh, there are quite a few. I do want to mention uh, several that have become more important to me over time. One is the broad appeal of container gardening. Um, children love it, as I said. People with physical limitations are able to garden and have fun. Novice gardeners and um, are often want to do this because it's an easy startup with gardening. And then there are gardeners who want to downsize or save time. Um, one of my best recommendations for container gardening is that, that you can overcome typical garden problems like shade, poor quality soil, or persistent soil-borne diseases. You can extend the growing season starting earlier in the spring and uh, uh, going into the fall to extend it. Location is also a, a great advantage because you have a lot of flexibility with your location or it could be permanent. Um, you want to make sure, however, that the containers that you use are placed in a convenient place. You have a lot more control over growing conditions such as water and sunlight and nutrients. And it's easier to protect your plants from extreme conditions, insect pests, and, and critters of all sorts. Using the advantage of vertical growth, particularly against walls, saves you a lot of space and allows you to use those exterior walls. However, there, it's not you know, the, perfect, um, the perfect situation. Um, you always need to know, no matter what, the needs of any plant that you put in a container. As well, you need to know the common diseases and insects that might plague this plant over time. You will have less um, of the fewer of those problems, but you do need to be aware of those particular issues. When we go through our particular issues with outdoor container gardening, that's uh, right plant, right pot, the growing medium, watering and fertilizing, right plant, right place, general maintenance and care, and overwintering. I want you to think about outdoor container gardening as a culture. It's a lot of fun. There are some surprises that occur, mostly good. But today I want to expand on a little bit about the science of container gardening. Um, it's, it's important to know some information that will influence the health and productivity of your uh, plants. So let's talk about pots and plants. I don't know about you, but when I go in a place that's got fantastic looking pots, I just, um, I can't make decisions. I want this and I want that and so on. Um, and that's important. It's important to think about the beauty of the pot. But at the same time, I want to put before you that pots can be a significant element in terms of the growth of the plant. No matter what, you have to consider moisture issues, the heat, how heat affects your pots, soil, and the roots of your plant. Container materials are important. You can go, uh, a list I could give you would be like cement, the clay terracottas, glazed or unglazed, stoneware, metal, plastic, uh, fiberglass, stone, plastic bags, uh, peat pots, um, even bio containers that we're going to discuss a little bit. There are pros and cons to each of those types. And so we are going to explore how those pros and cons can produce a significant growth or not in your pots. Other considerations obviously are cost, whether you can reuse or recycle the pots. Often you hear that plastic is a good material for beginners because it's affordable, holds moisture well, and it's lightweight. But pots of different materials do impact plant growth. So we're going to take a look at different types of pots uh, today. These basics apply to all pots, so I'll go through them uh, fairly carefully. 
First of all, cleanliness. Overwintered containers may harbor insect eggs, larva, and salt deposits. So one of the tasks that you have before you is to scrub your containers with hot soap and water and rinse them well because this will lower the likelihood of insect hatch, disease, or alkaline deposits. I know this takes uh, initial time and energy, but it will reward you with healthier planting. The dimensions. Be mindful very much so of root structure for your selected plants. Generally speaking, plants require a container of six to eight inches depth for adequate root growth, but that is not uh, sealed and delivered. It depends on the plant. Um, the drainage hole. At least one hole is necessary and you need to make sure you look inside pots before you buy them because sometimes there are not any um, uh, drainage holes. They're merely decorative. You also need to consider putting um, a piece of mesh, screen, or even a coffee filter over the hole to retain the soil so that uh, the nutrients will not drain out with soil over time. In terms of vegetables, uh, you need to think about the fully grown plant above and below in terms of the roots as you select a retainer, a container. You want to avoid so soil, that soil runoff that carries with it all the nutrients in your soil and you also do not want to have ever placed in your container any toxic product. Porous containers like clay, terracotta, absorb water faster and require more watering. You select plastic or glazed containers uh, to save time and to save water. Now these are all general uh, overall basics that apply throughout in terms of uh, container selection. Let's take a look at some things to think about in terms of placement. Hanging things up is an issue. So if your pot is going to, or basket is going to hang in the air, or going to be on a window sill or a fence or rail box, you want to plan to water it more often because winds and reflected heat will cause desiccation and the plant will dry out very fast. It can drip on people or possessions below. So you want to make sure you consider this when you hang it. You also want to consider safety factors. Um, make sure it's securely hung in a certain place. Materials that are hung, if they are in a metal container, the temperatures fluctuate more than non-metal ones. Dark colors absorb heat more than light colored ones. And this is often much more uh, impactful with small pots. Um, and it's also, you know, it becomes more of a problem in the sun than in the shade. Dark colored containers exposed to the intense summer sun get very, very hot. And this can transfer to the heat in the soil, which will damage your roots. Another very practical issue is can you reach it to water it? <laughs> All right, some other basics about placement considerations. Decks, porches, and balconies are wonderful places to have, particularly if you live in high rises or in a townhome community. I want to remind you that homeowners associations do have regulations about weight on balconies, uh, decks, and porches. And for you, to, that's something for you to check on in terms of regulations. For example, a 20 inch container filled with moist growing medium can weigh a hundred pounds or more. And so you want to make sure you check that out before you get that large container. Sun requirements for those of us that need a review, <clears throat> full sun is six to eight hours, part sun is four to six hours, uh, part shade is two to four hours, and uh, full shade is zero to two hours. Uh, one of the things that I recommend that you do is wherever you plan to put your pots, you want to maybe uh, map your sun to determine availability in the location. 
If you have an east facing location, you will have four or five hours of sun. A west facing is five to six hours and a south facing is six to eight hours. By mapping the sun, you can determine what vegetables or what plants needs will be met in particular locations. A note about microclimates. <clears throat> microclimates are um, areas that are different from the environment around them. If you have plantings uh, near brick, stone, and concrete, you're going to have the impact of radiant heat at night. If you have glass and metal, uh, that reflects light and heat. Building walls and shade provide cooling effects. And if you're in a high rise, or not necessarily, but this is a particular problem in high rises, you have wind tunnels. And wind tunnels can dry out plants. They can also damage them and tip them over. The suggestion is to group your pots and perhaps plant hardier ones as a windbreak. Some other overall issues with plants in terms of things you need to consider. We've talked a little bit about a few of these things, so I want to spend some time on porosity. Porosity is permeability. It's the ability of air and water to move through tiny pockets or spaces in the container material. If the material is porous, it will absorb water from planting media. Thus, the plant roots are in danger of drying out. Porous pots are not bad. In fact, um, a lot of people use them very successfully. But there are implications in terms of how frequently you must water and also caring for the container in the winter. Clay or terracotta materials, wire baskets are all very water absorbent. Peat pots also absorb water from planting medium. So you are going to lose water fast in those types of materials. Also water in the pores of pottery expands if frozen and this will con contribute to cracking. Um, the width of multiple plantings is something to take a look at. Um, so if you're planning to do multiples in a pot, take a look at the size of pots that you can have for six to eight plants, 16 to 20 inch pots are minimum for that many plants in a pot. Considerations from large pots. Obviously, large pots are hard to move and they require lots of potting mix to fill. So you want to consider that. Some people uh, problem solve that by putting uh, things like uh, shipping pell pellets or plastic um, pots or something in the bottom. And we're going to talk more about this later, but I, I don't recommend that very much unless you can really watch your pots carefully because drainage problems can develop from that. You can invert another smaller pot in inside the larger pot, but again, you have to be very conscious of water flow through your pot. Best recommendation for those real large pots is to put them on a dolly with casters so you can move it around easily for whatever reason you need to move it around. All right, I wanna dig in a little more, uh, no pun intended, to roots with an example. And this is for those of you particularly that are interested in vegetable planting. The example there is of a cucumber plant. I think it's uh, probably a bush or a compact variety. Cucumbers love water, uh, and so they do best in plastic or ceramic containers whose material retains moisture. The pot needs to be um, at least 12 inches across and 8 inches deep to have healthy cucumbers. The container should hold at least 5 to 7 gallons of potting mix and have good drainage for multiple plantings. Bigger is better with cucumbers because the larger volume of soil holds more water, but it's also heavier and less prone to tipping over because you usually have to provide some kind of structure for vertical growth. 
summarizing a pot that's 20 inches wide can accommodate probably four to six cucumber plants. Two or three plants will fit in a five gallon bucket or you can grow one cucumber in a 10 inch wide container. And this is research based information. You'll notice that doubling the pot size encourages uh, medium and deep rooting plants to grow 43% larger. Notice it does not apply to um, small non-deep uh, or medium deep rooting plants, the shallow ones with shallow roots. And we'll talk more about that. You want to make sure you have enough root space for anchoring, water uptake and nutrients. And it's not just the roots that go down, it's the roots that go horizontally, your lateral roots as well. You want to uh, factor in also the final height of your uh, mature plant to determine how much soil you will need. And we will talk a little bit more about that. I highly recommend, and this is in your resource guide, a website, Harvest to Table, because in that website, it will, uh, provide you with um, the size of the pot, like five to six inch pot, and how much soil volume is needed for healthy root growth. So for example, a 10 inch pot will probably need three gallons of soil media in order to um, be have adequate uh, space, root space, and so on for you. Another issue is um, we have to pl put in a plug for those native plants, but I want you to look at that in amazing drawing. Um, there are a lot of reasons to plant natives in containers. Probably the most important reason is that if you are going to have vegetable containers, especially in high rise locations, you need to plant some pots that will attract pollinators. Notice, however, that natives have a lot deeper roots. And so if you plant some black-eyed Susans in a container, just look at how um, both horizontally and vertically those roots uh, expand. Um, so make sure that you um, note the above and plan accordingly. Okay, with roots in mind, let's take a look at pots. We're going to go through the different types and talk about advantages and possibly some disadvantages and also some recommendations about what grows well in those types of pots. Of course, clay pots are porous and they breathe and this is an advantage because airflow, which is so important in the soil, deters fungal growth. And so um, that airflow um, is better because of the porosity. On the other hand, it dries out easier, which means you may have to um, uh, uh, water more often because uh, it absorbs the water. Um, it retains uh, water better. And so at this particular um, issue with the ceramic coated, uh, you can select plants that you know enjoy a drier environment. And so knowing your plant is so essential here. Uh, if you put um, thyme or oregano, rosemary, beans, okra in these plants, they will thrive. They won't survive, they will thrive. And there's a big difference. The next type plant is plastic. Plastic is probably the most popular. One of the advantages is that they're available in huge variety of shapes, sizes, colors, textures, including you know, whimsical designs. Uh, water retention, um, well, it depends on your plant, but plastic pots hold more water than clay. They have no porosity. I repeat, they have no porosity. So you want to plant in them plants that thrive in a moist soil. Plastic is very durable. It's tough, uh, it's virtually unbreakable, and it's very unlikely to break like clay pots do during freezing weather. Um, plastic is lightweight, and if you uh, plan to move your plants from place to place, that's very helpful. Even larger pots are more um, amenable to moving uh, easily and relocating. 
Um, plastic pots are more affordable. They are reasonably priced. Clay pots, as you well know, are often much more expensive. Recyclability is questionable. Um, Gardeners, as gardeners, you know, we are all concerned about the impact on the environment, especially single use plastic. So we're going to take a look at some options with bio containers uh, in terms of the impact that plastics have on the environment. Metal. Metal pots, of course, absorb and intensify heat. So they're good for tropicals like palms or banana plants, uh, sun-loving perennials like warm season grasses, and they do great with those vegetables. Watermelons, sweet potatoes, and hot peppers all thrive in metal containers. And self-watering pots, um, I use them, but I'm not a fan. Uh, I have difficulty figuring out when they need more water. Um, so if you know anything about self-watering pots, you know that they work by capillary action or wicking. When the soil starts to dry out, the water in the reservoir wicks up through the soil and begins to hydrate it. And some of these self-watering planters can go two or three weeks without having that reservoir uh, where you see the hole refill. That depends on the plant, it depends on the humidity and some other things, the size of the plant in the container. But it sure is convenient if you're going to be traveling and being away for a while. Um, there's one cautionary with uh, using these containers. They uh, tend towards salt buildup. So you want to avoid liquid and time-release fertilizers. It's recommended that you use a granular fertilizer worked into the soil not the reservoir, and this will keep the soil content down. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is very much recommended for edibles that like evenly moist soil, like tomatoes, basil, squash, and broccoli. Grow bags. Real popular, real space saver types of containers. Uh, there are many advantages of them. I'll mention only a few. The space constraints, when you finish, you can fold them up and put them away. They do support healthy oxygen growth. Um, they have much better drainage. But there are some disadvantages that are uh, we need to take a look at a little more closely. First of all, they are not very durable. Um, they don't last as long as hard body containers, generally speaking, two to three growing seasons. Some very expensive ones may last longer than that. Um, the cost, well, the cost, you know, may not be cost effective for you because you're going to be replacing them more often than you do other types of containers. And so that may not really compute for you. For example, a five gallon bag um, can start around six dollars um, and so if you're replacing your grow bags uh, every two or three years obviously that will add up over time. Aesthetics is another thing. If you like pretty pots or chic ceramic and terracotta pots these usually are just solid colors oftentimes just black or white or gray um, and so you know grow bags are basically um, they just look well like bags and sacks, so you've got to be happy with that. Environmental concerns um, is that um, they aren't all eco-friendly. They're not all biodegradable, so you, know, you use them more often. Uh, they have plastics in them that don't break down, so um, the problem comes when you have to replace them um, and uh, discard them. Another big problem is the consumption of water with uh, grow bags. They require more watering than any other traditional pots. And uh, this is one of the big gardening downsizes with use of them. They are touted for their mobility as well, but that's not always the case. Uh, if you have some of those big 20 gallon ones, they're very difficult to move once they've been planted and they also don't have 
necessarily sturdy walls or structural strength like traditional pots. And if they have fabric handles on them, I've known them to be prone to tearing. So you have to consider those, um, those pros and cons with the use of those. All right, I do wanna spend some time on the use of bio containers because they are sustainable options and I'm sure some of you have already been using them. But here are some facts for those of you that don't, don't know much about them. They're made of animal and plastic based byproducts such as coir, paper fibers and rice hulls. Um, the containers can either be plantable or compostable. Plantables are very porous and they can be placed directly into the soil. Compostables have to be removed before planting and they can be placed in a compost pile. They will degrade over a period of time. The good news is that both types of those containers support strong roots, good top growth and blooming. There are a couple of controversial issues with them. Container integrity is one of them. Uh, they don't sometimes maintain their shape and form and a pleasing appearance. Cost is another issue that impacts consumers and growers alike. And another issue is the existing production systems like transplant machines, transplanting machines are geared to things like traditional plastic pots. So the green industry has to go through a whole uh, change in the way it introduces and there's a lot of uncertainty with that. Um, as a gardener, you can talk with your, uh, uh, your garden centers and nurseries about having more of these pots because you are the consumer and that is what they need to hear. Um, let's take a closer look because it might be a little bit hard to read this. On the left hand side is a cow pot. It's uh, made of dehydrated, you got it, cow manure and some cardboard pulp. It's suitable for annuals and vegetable transplants. Below that is recycled paper. It's uh, made of uh, types of recycled newspaper and other kinds of paper. It's suitable for annuals, perennials, and vegetable transplants. To the right, you see the paper sleeve. It's totally wood fibers. It's suited for annuals, um, plugs, and vegetable transplants. And then the bottom right is coconut choir, which is made of coconut fibers. It's compostable and plantable. It's suitable for perennials and woody plants. Okay, I think we have covered the pots about as much as we can, but lots to think about in the selection of pots. Let's turn our attention to growing medium basics. Folks, it's all about the soil. Containers uh, are very important and impact the health, but soil is so critical. So let's take a look at a couple of slides that uh, educate you on that. Um, you want to make sure that you research the soil requirements of your plantings. Um, so we will talk about the differences with that. Um, choosing packaged potting soil um, is appropriate for most plants. You always wanna check the NPK, that's the nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and potassium rating for uh, that's on your uh, potting soil. It should be fairly balanced, like 10, 10, 10. This, this supplies adequate foliage and fruiting development. If not that, then you need to select soil according to perhaps the pH needs of your plantings, like if it needs a very acidic soil. Soil is media, is, uh, contains peat moss and perlite or vermiculite, but it has no nutrients because um, Soilless mixture is sterile. It has no bacteria or fungi that's found in real soil or dirt. These mixes are very light uh, and they support, uh, they're very light and it's hard for them to support adequate plant rootings. And of course they don't lack nutrient, they lack nutrients. So you wanna avoid using them with vegetables. And I will say that again. Um, you want to leave ample room at the uh, top of your container, at least one to two inches um, so that the soil runoff will not occur because this, this keeps the nutrients in. 
Another issue is some people want to use their garden soil because those tomatoes out in their garden did so well. Well, that you can, there's some things you can do with garden soil, but I don't recommend it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They introduce disease and pests um, and, and soil in the garden is much thicker than potting soil and therefore it will not drain very well, which is all about um, problems that uh, can occur with root rot. Uh, please note on the um, slide that excessive vermiculite can absorb moisture from root hairs. And that's something you wanna be careful about, particularly if you do DIY your soil. All right, getting more in depth. <clears throat> As I said, soil is everything. Um, one of the things you can do if you are um, uh, wanting to use garden soil, you can uh, use it, but then it has to be amended. Remember, it's so thick with equal parts of peat, moss, perlite, or coarse builder sand. Um, know that that doesn't keep out pests. It doesn't keep out diseases. It doesn't keep out weeds. Some people sterilize their garden soil, and there's a method of doing that that I'm not going to discuss. I've never done it, and I don't plan to. Um, bag soil mixes, let's take a look at what's inside of them. They have um, sterilized garden loam with additives <coughs> like peat, sand, bark chips, vermiculite, uh, or perlite. Usually they contain nutrients. They provide stability for your plants. Um, they retain water and nutrients better than soilless mix. If you're going to have a plant in a container for more than a year or so, this is your better choice is the soil-based mix. I use a combination of one-third compost and two-thirds potting medium. I also re reuse my potting medium for several years. And when you re reuse potting medium, you do need to keep in mind that the original nutrients that were in the mix uh, have probably all been um, washed out from watering. And so you want to make sure that you add some nutrients to your soil prior to planting. Soilless media is really based on peat moss. There is no soil in these. They do contain perlite and vermiculite. They're lightweight. They're really good for hanging baskets. Uh, they dry out quickly, which means they have to be watered more frequently. If they have any nutrients at all that you've added, then they lose them quickly. <clears throat> they are fine for annuals, but uh, repeating, they are not recommended for vegetable planting. I've mentioned vermiculite and perlite, and I want to make sure if you're a DIY soil person that you do know the difference in the two. Vermiculite retains more water and for longer periods of time. Um, vermiculite also offers uh, less aeration, so the oxygen doesn't get through as well. Perlite retains less water, but it drains so much better that it has an advantage in terms of aeration. So what we're saying is the type of plant should influence your choice of media. Plants like succulents and herbs and perennials tend to prefer soils that are well drained and they don't retain a lot of moisture over a long period of time. For them, you might want to choose coarser, a coarser media that has more bark, perlite, or sand in it. For things like tropicals and foliage plants, you would choose a media with more peat and less coarse materials because they prefer uh, moist growing conditions. <laughs> Let's turn our attention from soil to water. All right, here are the general best management practices for watering basics with a container. Water in the morning. Now, the reason for this, I know it's not always possible, but it sure is the best, way, best thing to do because it minimizes evaporation losses that will happen toward as the sun gets hotter in, in the afternoon. It also uh, lessens the effects of desiccation by wind and more importantly than anything, it reduces leaf wetness that can promote disease. If you water in the evening or late afternoon, there's no sun overnight to dry those leaves out. And so they're more prone 
to get fungal types of problems. When you um, water, try to avoid extensive overhead watering. Um, you want to apply the water toward the roots until it drains out the soil out of the hole that's in the bottom of the pot. And this is to make sure that, you know, you know the good drainage is going on. Saucers are a good idea to use sometimes to capture water, but you have to keep your eye out on them. If these saucers are in direct contact with the container and they have standing pools, they can contribute to root rot. Just like soggy soil, if you overwater, this also promotes root rot because it prevents adequate airflow in your soil. When you have excessive heat or wind, you want to check your plants daily during those events. The best way to check them is the finger test. And if you don't know what the finger test is, is to press your finger down to the second knuckle. And if it's dry, you need water. If not, wait a little while. Another way to um, reduce water requirements is to use about a quarter inch of mulch on the top of your container. And if you're in a high rise or if there's a heavy wind, uh, provide <clears throat> wind screens or small fencing to prevent the desiccation. Water absorbing polymers are often used by people to, uh, they're like little granules of sugar, sugar and then they, uh, they fill up when you water and they act like little sponges in the soil. Research has shown that adding this to your soil has not had any long-term benefits. So you might think about that because they're also fairly expensive. All right, watering basics onto fertilizing basics. Okay, um, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll mention again, the necessity of more frequent watering for container gardens and well-drained soil to avoid root rot is important, but because you have to water frequently, you are also uh, flushing out essential nutrients as you do so. And if you're concerned about that, you want to be looking for signs of nutrient deficiency in your plants. Those signs are leaf yellowing or browning, stunted growth, and poor flowering or poor fruiting. If you choose the potting soil mixes, know that they are have fertilizer in them and that this will last eight to 10 weeks and then you'll need to refertilize. What I do is I calendar the next fertilizing eight to 10 weeks later, depending on the weather. Slow release fertilizers, of course, release nutrients slowly after each watering of the plants. If you use slow release fertilizer, it eliminates the risk of fertilizer burn and it stays in the soil longer. You want to always have the same NPK ratings that are important in the same planter. Um, you know, generally speaking, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium for most plants is a balanced one of 10, 10, 10 for flowering or fruiting. Um, excuse me, <coughs> for flowering or fruiting, you need uh, a little more one higher in phosphorus. For vegetables, you might want to make sure that your uh, fertilizer has a little more um, calcium and magnesium in it. A word about bone meal. If you use organic fertilizers like bone meal, you want to research the impact on your plants. Bone meal is high in phosphorus, increasing early growth and root formation and encouraging flowering and fruit production. But too much phosphorus can greatly damage your plants by making it difficult for the plant to absorb other nutrients like micronutrients. Most vegetable plants benefit from an annual application, an annual application of bone meal, but it's particularly a beneficial to root crops like carrots and parsnips and turnips. Even flowers that are grown from bulbs, corms, and tubers will benefit from an application of bone meal. Always, always read the, your product labels very carefully about fertilizing. More is not better. Over fertilizing can produce yellowing and uh, wilting on lower leaves. 
Uh, it can produce browning of leaf margins and tips. It will make the roots uh, rot. They'll get black, brown, mushy. You'll have slow to no growth. You'll have some leaf drop. And even a crust of fertilizer will be on the top of the soil. So follow the instructions for the recommended rate. All right. Right plant, right place. I can't say how much it's important to use some native plants to draw pollinators in your garden. Um, another issue is that when you uh, plant in your containers, make sure that they're good companions. Um, put the sun loving plants together, the shade lovers together. You want to plant the ones that need more water together and less water together. So by grouping that, you're not only supporting, um, by, the, by grouping them with uh, certain cultural requirements, you're not only supporting the health of the plant, but it's easier for you to take care of. I mentioned microclimates and I'm going to mention those again that because they can cause a very big impact um, on a deck or a porch, um, a patio. Uh, one thing that I have done is I have set a thermometer in different locations locations or recorded temperatures throughout the day. Uh, and of course, what you usually find is that south and west facing areas are warmer spots, north facing are cooler, and east facing, of course, gets the morning sun. Another thing to think about is under eaves or covered patios, uh, that provides some shelter from frost. And if you have any containers that you're locating at the bottom toward a hill or a slope, as I do, Remember that cold air flows downward and that can impact your plants as the weather cools. Understanding microclimate can be a gardening advantage and so you want to use it. Um, I have grown tomatoes in pots in several locations. Here it's on my deck and they did well, uh, but that was the only place I had very much sun and it was mostly morning sun. So, Last year, I located my deck and tomato cages on my driveway, my concrete driveway, and they did, I would say, four or five times more production than I'd ever had, and it was that warm, hot concrete. So use it to your advantage. Okay. Plant selection. Do mix edibles with ornamentals. The only thing you have to think about with that is to make sure that what you're mix, mixing have the same requirements of soil and water and nutrients. There are lots of flowers that are edible, pansies, marigolds, nasturtiums. Probably the most popular and easy way of arranging pots is through the thriller, filler, spiller um, method, where you have a tall plant that catches your attention uh, a round molding plant that you fill the pot up with, and then the spiller part that drapes over the side. Um, color considerations are things like, do you want it to complement or contrast to the background where your container will be located? Uh, what about the outside colors of your home? What about leaf colors? So you, color is something that you want to consider. All right. In terms of plant selection, selection, you do need, as I've said before, to know your roots, know your varieties, know your soil volume. You want to be informed about your varieties, especially if you choose smaller pots due to space limitations. So miniature tomato varieties will grow in an eight inch pot, roughly the size of like a gallon container. A two gallon or a five gallon container can support larger, indeterminate or vining tomatoes and hold enough moisture for you know three or more days when the weather turns hot. This resource, this particular slide is a resource on a website that I have put on the, um, the uh, resource handout. So you can refer to it. So I will not go over uh, all the different possibilities. Just being aware of what veggies thrive in specific size pots encourages health growth. So you don't want to plant a tomato in a four inch pot because its roots are very deep. And so knowing a little bit about the science does help with, with uh, growth. The above recommendations do support healthy root development 
per the type vegetable that is mentioned. And getting a little more specific, let's look at shallow rooted vegetables. For a 12 by 12 container, these dimensions represent the optimum depth and width for thriving root structures to grow. Now you're going to notice though that some of those vegetables are listed beyond 12 inches. So you may be scratching your head and saying, well, um, you know, what do I do about that? Uh, like summer squash, for example. Um, well, one option is to not overplant in, in the uh, container. And a lot of shallow rooted vegetables have fibrous roots. And so the roots spread uh, out toward the, you know, maybe top four, three or four inches. So um, you want to make sure that you don't put shallow rooted vegetables in too deep a pot. But um, they, that is one, one issue is that fibrous roots um, are, are very, um, have their own needs and uh, they are have the opposite needs of plants that have tap roots. Medium rooted vegetables, 18 by 24 inch container recommended. Uh, notice, however, that things like beans and winter squash have, can grow root structures beyond 24 inches. So you want to plan for that possibility. Deep rooted vegetables, um, again, 24 by 36 inch container, you see the possibilities and look at the tomato plant there, okay? The container size will determine whether one, two, three or more can be planted. But just remember that uh, you wanna consider that shallow rooted vegetables may not thrive in a deep container because of those fibrous roots. Pollination. Um, for those of you that, that aren't real sure about what that means, or I'm sure everybody does, but I want to review it just to make sure you can understand the impact of lack of. Pollination is the transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma for um, fertilization. And it is very essential for fruit and seed development. Uh, no pollination, no tomatoes. And of course, the pollination occurs through insects and birds and mammals. Sometimes you have to do it by hand. So let's talk about that. Um, if you live on a balcony or enclosed patio, especially if it's um, high rise, this can be a real challenge for pollinators. Are they going to make it to the 11th floor, okay? If you don't see any bees or other insects in your garden, there probably is not much pollination, if any, going on. Uh, so you may not find that. So what do you do about it? If you're not getting any fruit on your vegetables, et cetera, then something, there are things you can do. Um, you can pollinate them yourself. Um, you want to make sure you pollinate. If you go that route, you pollinate uh, early in the morning. You can transfer the pollen using a small paintbrush, or you can just gently shake, gently shake the branches. And I've seen videos of how people used electric toothbrushes to buzz uh, the plant. And that's actually all you need. Uh, you know, when pollination occurs, it's those wings of insects that are buzzing around that cause the pollen to spill out. And so um, you therefore pollinate. So this happened to me last year. And I thought I had that taken care of, but I wasn't, my tomatoes were not producing as well. They were little patio tomatoes. And so um, I decided I would just shake them a little bit. And I did that a little bit every day. And darn, if it didn't work, I, it like and within a week or so, there were buds all over the place and my fruit was coming out. So don't ask, underestimate that just because you have, you know, some kind of flowers around that the pollination is going to occur. So make sure you're watchful for that. Okay, with all that in mind, let's take a look at some issues with potting your plants. First of all, you wanna prepare your potting medium. Now that means checking for fertilizer to make sure that you have what you want in terms of the NPK. You also want to make sure that the um, 
the soil structure is what we call friable. Um, it may need to be moistened a little bit in order to be that way. But when friable means that when you scoop up the soil and you squeeze it in your hand, it leaves an imprint. It doesn't just drop out your hand. It doesn't look like a, a mud pie. Um, it's, it's got some structure to it. And um, so you want to check for those two things. Otherwise, you need to do some mending and fertilizing. Um, you can amend the soil structure of your pot by using worm castings, perlite, or vermiculite. Um, nutrients do not amend for soil structure. For, you know, that's not it. Fertilizer, um, of course, is you need to add some nutrients uh, physically to the soil to influence the plant growth, uh, but that doesn't help texture. So if you wanna solve both issues, your best bet is to use compost and manure. Um, they are both amendments and they're fertilizer. They can improve texture and they add nutrients. So go with those organics and you've covered your bases. You wanna prepare the container. You want to make sure of course it's clean, and if you're using those clay pots, they do need to be watered and soaked a little bit because they dry out so fast. And the plantings, you don't want the roots to have a dry environment from the very beginning. Uh, you wanna make sure your drainage is where it needs to be. Remember we talked about the holes in the bottom covered up with porous screen to prevent soil loss. Um, you can use saucers, but um, just make sure to catch the runoff, but just make sure they don't sit in standing water. Uh, that, that's gonna contribute to root rot again. By this time, you should have made a decision about the right pot, right pot size. And remember that has all the world to do with root health and uh, the thriving of your plant rather than the surviving of your plant. You should have also decided on the location that is most beneficial for your plant. And let's talk a little bit about fillers. You'll see in the in the picture the those little pellets and the men mentions you can use peanuts, pop bottles, plastic containers, and so on. The thing about those is that you really have to watch for the drainage coming out those drain holes, and it's because of the scientific phenomenon called perched water table. If for some reason those fillers start blocking water drainage, then the water is going to perch in one location in the pot and the roots are going to grow toward that location or they're not going to grow toward that location. And so you have this situation where um, you're either going to oversaturate or dry out your roots. So if you decide to put filler in your pot, then you want to make sure that every time you water, you check that the water is running out of those drain holes. So we are at potting your plants. And this is pretty much a step-by-step -step type of thing. Uh, you want to make sure, first of all, that you've covered that drain hole with a, something like a call frequent filter, landscape cloth, or something in the bottom of the pot. You want to place a small amount of potting mix, several inches, uh, depending on the size of the pot, in the bottom. You want to take the um, plant, empty it from the pot it's in, you know, the nursery pot that it's in, and then you want to check the roots uh, of that to see if any of the roots have circled around the pot and appear to be pot bound. If they do, you want to gently tease those little roots very gently out with your fingers so that they will go in the right direction in terms of planting. Next, you wanna place the plant stem so that it'll be at the same level as it was in the original pot uh, that it was in. And then you put in potting mix uh, to fill the pot the one to two inches below the rim. And of course, we've said how much this helps the mix runoff. After you do that, you want to water until the water flows out the bottom of the container to make sure the drainage is good. Or some people choose to submerge a, a pot in a bucket of water to soak from bottom up. 
I always elevate my pot either on feet or on tables uh, to allow for the drainage um, to flow out and prevent using saucers that have standing water. This is just a good way of avoiding uh, root rot, salt deposits, and yes, mosquitoes. Okay. Care basics. This is a photo I took last summer of a canna leaf curler caterpillar. Looks gross and vicious, doesn't it? Well, it will eat them alive. And then you see the frass down there at the bottom of the um, plant. They are much on your leaves. Uh, literally much the life out of them. So let's talk about some of the common problems with containers. And one of the most common problems is too much or too little water. Uh, finger test, don't guess, okay? Finger test, don't guess. One of the issues with pots is that air movement and not just inside the soil, but also beneath the pot itself. Um, you want to allow pots to your soil to breathe and allow plants to breathe. Soil that's heavily saturated with water from source saucers directly in contact with the container restricts your air circulation in the soil. So elevated is your best practice. Portability is also a best practice. You want to be able to uh, move your pots around, whether it's physically by hand or putting them on casters so that um, you can protect them from bad weather um, or you can move them to more sun or more shade to accommodate their requirements. If you uh, have plants that are climbers, you want to use vertical and horizontal supports, but you want to install these structures early to avoid damaging the plants later um, when they grow uh, up. Um, if you observe pests, as I did with the um, leaf curler at Caterpillar, your first choice is to hand remove rather than use a pesticide. Um, that's just an, a good way, a good best managed practice. Pesticides would be a last resort. You can remove waning or disease foliage to avoid the spread of disease rather than use an herbicide. So when your, when your tomato leaves in the bottom start getting a little yellow and it's toward the end of the season, but you think you're gonna have more, et cetera, remove those leaves to avoid the spread of any disease as because they are decaying. Another possibility is to use some organics like horticultural oil, neem oil, or insecticidal soap because um, they work very well, depending on the, whether you use them in a timely manner and they are correctly used. Like you don't apply things like that when it's you know, above 80 degrees or 90 degrees in the hot sun because it will kill the leaves. Sorry, overwintering basic. Um, overwintering is an issue with pots, particularly porous pots need to be protected over the winter. You can store them uh, upside down or on their sides in a dry place. Um, containers left outside that have hardy perennial, perennials in them should be wrapped, you know, like in bubble wrap or, or burlap that might be covered in plastic to protect the wetness from wetness. Remember that the container temperature is the same as the surrounding temperature. Um, tender perennials such as the, the kind that won't survive frost like coleus or geraniums, the only thing you can do with them is make cuttings and those cuttings uh, you can nurture in a sunny window. Uh, half hardy plants that won't survive hard frost like dahlias or Gerber daisies you can put in a basement or a garage. They need to be kept in a cool temperature and unheated space so they can drop their leaves and go dormant. Hardy perennials uh, like that stay outdoors like Susan's or coneflowers, they should be cut back to four or five inches above the soil line once their leaves drop after the first hard frost. In the picture on the right, you'll see my native Panicum vergatum Shenandoah switchgrass. And I overwintered it on a covered porch. Um, it could have stayed outside, but the deal with uh, quite often grasses is not so much the cold, it is too much water in the container. And so in order to avoid getting soggy roots and root rot, I brought them inside to protect them. So there are lots of things to think about in terms of overwintering, but those are a few things to guide you.
All right. We're going to turn our attention. I'm not sure where we are with time, but we're going to turn our attention. Oh, we've got some time um, to the trendy um, uh, things that are going on with containers. Um, and uh, these are um, these topics are really for the ultimate gardener or for someone that just wants to try something different for a change. There's no way that I can go through very, every detail of these topics and explore it thoroughly. But, um, and, and also I have not done any carnivorous containers, nor have I done uh, the roses or fruit crops. Fruit crops are, is next on my list. It's just like anything else. It's an experiment being a gardener. But different techniques beyond container gardening basics is what we're focusing on. If for some reason we don't get into a whole lot of detail, which we probably will not, the resource uh, page that is uh, attached to your email uh, is uh, full of detailed information and websites to guide you if you are interested in some of these particular uh, ways of container gardening. All right, let's first of all look at uh, tree crops. The deal with uh, tree crop is understanding um, dwarf varieties. Dwarf varieties work well in pots. They range from 5 to 12 feet, but the amount of fruit produced is proportionate to the plant size. Uh, what you want to do is to check out the label with the type of dwarf rootstock. Uh, there are two true dwarf rootstock preferred for containers. And they have a code. One is M27 and the other is G65. M27 is a true dwarf remaining under six feet. Um, the more recently developed G65 is hard to find and it's really not a true dwarf. It climbs around eight feet. Um, it does, however, as compared to the other one, other choice, the M27, it offers greater disease resistance. So if you're shopping around, obviously you want to know those codes depending on what research requires you in terms of what you want to purchase. Semi-dwarf rootstock. So the dwarf varieties are, have those codes. The semi-dwarf rootstock, um, are, they top out a lot bigger, they're like 12 feet. The dwarf produces in two to three years and the semi-dwarf in four to six years. And the semi-dwarf produces larger crops, obviously because the tree is much bigger. All of them need full sun. Uh, they grow best in full sun, though I did read some research that said that some will produce in a partial shade but the pr production rate will be a lot lower. It is almost mandatory that unless you have um, uh, a warmer climate that your container be on casters. That's perfect for fruit trees. So consider that you need to be able to move it around. Um, the pot size that is recommended is a minimum of five gallons, but for maximum healthy growth, 15 to 20 is better. Uh, the width should be 18 to 24 inches and the depth should be 12 to 16 inches. Soil media, um, commercial potting soil is, is fine. It's okay. Uh, and you water it thoroughly uh, as needed, but do not fertilize until new growth commences. Again, resources are included uh, about more detail for these ideas. Okay, the good news about pollination is that many types of fruit trees are self-fruitful and they do not need to reproduce with other plants. Examples are um, most citrus fruits are self-fruitful, most peaches, nectarines and apricots are self-fruitful. But for example, sweet cherries are not. The best advice in that case is to either ask your vendor whether the variety is a self-pollinator or better yet, take a list of self-pollinators and ask for those particular varieties. Fertilizer, a little tricky here. 
Research points out that tree fruit in containers need a low analysis fertilizer. It's very beneficial to fruit production. Uh, low analysis means the NPK is low. For example, like 513 or 935, meaning 5% nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, and 3% uh, potassium. Another recommendation is fish emulsion. Very beneficial and it's recommended that you use it weekly the first year and monthly thereafter. Watering, the only problem watering is that folks tend to overwater. That's the usual culprit. Uh, just keep in mind soil and plastic, metal and ceramic containers, uh, ceramic covered containers stay wetter longer. So just be careful, you're mindful of other uh, best management practices with your containers. For the most part, just like anything else, the upper surface of the soil should become dry to the touch before watering. Pruning. You want the sun to shine in, but it requires, and pruning is little or none with, with uh, dwarf and semi-dwarf varieties, but if you do have legginess or some need to, to trim it back, I do recommend, and there are resources for this, Virginia Tech provides thorough information about pruning fruit crops including pruning calendars for various types. So check those resources. Overwintering has to do with knowing your fruit. Different fruit trees have different needs and aversions to cold. As fall approaches, you wanna gradually reduce your watering and stop fertilizing to get your tree ready for the cold weather and shorter days. Um, bringing things indoors, citrus should be brought indoors before a first frost and when the nights dip into the 30s. Deciduous fruits such as apples and blueberries and figs should be allowed to drop their leaves outdoors. Then you move them indoors soon afterward in colder climates. All right, so there are the fruits. Shade plants, some of my favorites. My yard is full of shade and I, I try to take full advantage of it. Often clients in the help desk inquire about gardening with little sun and that, that applies to patios and, and decks and sheltered porches. What can they grow on those, in those sh shady areas? So let's look at some ideas. I would go for several things. One is I would create um, some kind of pattern like three heights of plants, um, a tall, medium and a low. You could use like a tall fern in the middle, put some hosta around that and maybe some impatience around those. And that would make a nice um, plant, planter. Another thing is to, to use a bold color. And one research that I noticed said that one of the best is silver. It's something using choosing plants with silver leaves. And these are, there on the right is purple dragon lamium. And it is a beautiful plant. And it has those purple, uh, excuse me, those uh, silver leaves. But silver pairs a lot with most flower colors. It gives you a soft glow and a pop in soft light. The real deal, though, with um, shade is that in shade gardening containers, foliage always trumps blossoms. So you want to go for the beautiful leaves. Uh, that, that's just things like ferns, brunera hellebores, wild ginger, sedges, coleus, and so on. Uh, the leaves are everything. Use native plants as you can. Some resources for native plants and containers were provided. As again, they attract pollinators. Things like breeding, bleeding heart uh, in the spring, um, uh, blue lobelia, Pennsylvania sedge in the summer, coral bells in the fall. Uh, you'll find a, a really extensive list of native plants you can use for shade planting. Since we're talking shade, you want to avoid overwatering because shade is more susceptible due to the lack of not being in a direct line of a drying sun. Um, make sure that the shade plants that you put together, as with anything else, they share the same needs for nutrients, water, and soil. Again and again, know your plant. It's very critical in containers. Porch pots, and this one I have experimented with a lot. What are porch pots? Why are they called that? Well, <clears throat> obviously they go on porches, 
but they're also a gardener's response to the need for fall and winter garden interest. Um, you can use repurposed, repurposed materials and plants like berries, they have berries, evergreen foliage, brightly colored stems and so on. And it just really lights up uh, your uh, area. All of these photos on this page are from my porch pots, different things that I, I um, use. You don't have to have different containers. You could use repurpose um, soil and repurpose containers. All you need is enough of the container and soil to support uh, the plants, the things that you put in it. So um, you can use evergreens or perennials. Um, you may have to spray them with a little bit of water you can use soil that's already filled in a container, a bushel basket, a tub. They still need to have some drainage holes because of, of uh, freezing or overflowing from storms. I would not use terracotta because of that reason. You can put uh, sand in the pots. You can use uh, garden soil, just so long as it's solid enough to support plant stems and to hydrate those stems by retaining a little bit of water. The fun part is foraging and collecting. I am addicted to foraging. Um, it's like when I take a long walk, I'll take some kind of bag with me and I'll look for things like removed bamboo canes or a piece of wood in the park and uh, forage and collect that. Foraging is a fun uh, hobby. However, you need to think about a few things as you do so. Always, when you harvest something, only take a tiny percentage of a plant, like American holly is a beautiful foraged plant. If you find that, just take, you know, a small amount, just enough that you need, and try not to leave a, a trace. Um, you want to identify what you are uh, taking to avoid poisonous plants or even endangered species. You don't want to mess with those. Invasives like Nandina, which is very popular for its berries, once you've finished with it, you want to make sure you dispose of it in the trash, not in a composting situation. You want to protect yourself against ticks or poison ivy. A collecting sources, my favorite are from my own garden, my friends and neighbors garden, um, parks, but one of the best places during a holiday season is to get the the trimmings that have been discarded from garden centers. And you, you know, they are, have no problem with you taking those particular, uh, for the most part, those particular things. Um, in the Mid-Atlantic, we have a treasure trove of, of possibilities. Um, you can use conifers, berry bearing plants, and um, you can use dried flowers. Uh, my favorite are cedar and holly oak leaf hydrania, uh, laurels, spruce for foliage. Uh, I have a red, red and a yellow twig, dogwood. I also have a birch and those are all, those are very, very nice. Looking at a few of the pictures very quickly, to the right, you will see that, that this is a recycled fall mum. And, you know, a lot of people just throw them out. Uh, I don't. Um, what I do is, I guess, kill them even more, but I put spray them with silver or gold, usually silver, and I put ornaments in them for a holiday planter and put them in a basket. And they are beautiful, they last for months. So that's one possibility. I have canna lilies and I use the seed pods and dried arrangements. This one I was working with inside, but it went outside in a planter. My panicles from my native switchgrass, I eventually trimmed those off and put them in a container that I put on my porch. This is in a, my forage cedar and American holly. I also use corkscrew willow to accent and that corkscrew willow actually started leafing a couple of, of weeks ago, so it took root. Uh, and this of course is the advantage of porch pots. Notice the little mockingbird enjoying your por the porch pot berries, the winter berry uh, there. Just a precious thing to support nature during your winter season. All right, the impact of porch pots, and again, these are all photos from my experiences. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the preparation of materials because that is given to you with information. 
of in the resource, uh, especially by using anti-transference -trans like wilt proof or wilt stop to um, support the um, uh, rigidity of your plants. But I do wanna point out on the left that this is my cut and trim switchgrass um, that I brought inside eventually for a dried arrangement. Um, during the holidays, I had several porch pots um, that I arranged with dried citrus and other plantings. Um, to the top right, you'll see that uh, I have a planter that has a yellow twig dogwood that took root and it is now blooming and um, uh, it, it is now a seasonal thing that I use year round. Snow, we had a little bit of snowfall and this was one where you can see the corkscrew, corkscrew willow that I did purchase. That was one of my few purchases this year and some spruce and other things. Just look at all that you can do at this, you know, with uh, just recycling materials. Maintenance is just what you would expect it to be. Uh, you, um, mine usually lasts from November through February. All I do is occasionally water and freshen them with a few other plantings. All right, Be feeling bogged down. Um, I think we will just talk very briefly about a few things here. Um, this is, uh, kids love this. Um, it requires little care and it has so much adventure to it. It's like the creatures of the prehistoric past and, and thriving in muddy bogs and plus you can watch them eat supper and so on. What kid would not love that kind of scenario? Um, be careful about getting uh, uh, these from, uh, uh, you wanna get them uh, propagated plants from reliable sources um, because a lot of them are on rare and endangered lists. So illegal harvesting can cost you as much as $50,000 in the state of North Carolina. Most common ones are pitcher plants, Venus flytrap and sundew. Um, again, I'm not gonna go through all the different ways of creating a bog ecosystem, but that is what you have to do. The one caveat in, in working with um, uh, this type of um, planting is that you have to be careful to use only mineral free water like rainwater or bottled sodium free drinking water. Otherwise creating a bog is like making a mud puddle or something and kids love it. And it's so much fun to watch those things development. And also around here, they can be left outside all year in zone seven. So you don't have to bring them inside. And I know you're glad to hear that if you wanna do it. <laughs> Finally, um, a little bit about roses. Um, the main thing is, and I'm just gonna mention a few things. You can get the details later. The big question is, do you want to, uh, which is more robust, the bare root or the pre-containerized? And it just depends on you and what you want to do. But the containerized rose has already grown in the pot. So next step is for it just to adjust to that new location, which it masters 99% of the time. Bare root is cheaper and uh, it can, uh, has a lot more variety. So whatever you do, you have to make that decision on your own. Um, roses are particularly susceptible to microclimates. So putting them in containers makes you have more control over that. Roses do not like competition from other plants, including neighboring roses. So having them in containers, they are happy, happy. You also have fewer soil problems in containers because you know Virginia soil is very clay, although it's full of nutrients. And uh, the rose requires a lot of uh, aeration and avoid fungal types of infections. And so having them in a container does help with that. Easier to care for, you know, you can get under the leaves if you need to spray them with something. If you use a container, it's recommended that you use a plastic container of at least two to, two to 2.5 feet in depth and at least 15 to 20 inches in diameter. Those are recommended. If you choose bare root, uh, it is an entire process to plant it and you have to use soaking and preparation and so on. And that is included in the handout uh, for those of you that might want to, check, to choose bare root container preparation. And so, we made it.
Okay, hi, Anne. Um, we have a bunch of questions and we have about 10 or 15 minutes. So right. we'll try and get to all of them. Uh, early on in the talk, someone asked about using a very tall container, but not needing all the space for the plant and what to use as a filler. Uh, I know you mentioned that for a smaller plant, uh, but for a very tall container, what would you recommend? And a related question was, what kind of a liner would you put between the soil and whatever filler you put in a container? Um, the kind of, you're talking, I'm assuming they're talking about the uh, drainage hole. Um, use something that is porous for that drainage hole. It could be a coffee filter, some kind of wire mesh. You don't want to stop up the drainage hole with something that does, it's not permeable. Um, and if you have a filler, could you put, would you put the, um, would you put the coffee filter or screen between the filler and the soil? You would put it, you would put it over the hole itself and then the soil on top of that. Okay. And what would you do to separate, say, filler from the soil? Um, in terms of filler, like if you're talking about putting plastic, whatever, you know, can't, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's nothing wrong with doing that. It's anything that you want to use that's um, not biodegradable, but anything you want to use is fine. It's just that you need to continuously watch to make sure that when you water, the water is draining out of the pot because you want to avoid uh, root rot and root rot can occur if the drainage is stopped up. And uh, one of the problems with that is something I mentioned called a perched water table. You want to avoid your water collecting in pockets in your soil. So as long as you're watching and making sure that the drainage comes out, then you're good to go. Thank you, that answered another question. Um, early on, someone asked, uh, is it possible to paint the inside of terracotta pots with something like marine paint if you're worried? about uh, water being absorbed by the pot? Um, I don't know much about marine paint. Okay. And so I, I could not, I could certainly research it. And if that person put it in the, um, you know, the chat box, of course, yeah. I can research and come up with an answer. Uh, the paint, paint can contain toxic materials. And so you want to make sure that you are, are not using something that's going to cause a problem there, but I'd need to research that. All right, thank you. Um, do you have any hints for someone who has trouble with birds nesting in their hanging containers? <laughs> Enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I think that one of the reasons that um, I garden is to attract pollinators and birds are pollinators. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I guess you could just keep shooing them out. You could, you know, I wouldn't put netting over it because birds can get caught in things like that. Yeah. And that's not a very pretty situation. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's what we live with sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, a related question and opposite to it was someone else wanted to attract hummingbirds to their uh, pots. Do you have uh, recommendations for doing that? Yeah, you know, any kind of uh, like red flowers, anything with red uh, colors to it does attract them. Um, and we certainly do have a list of, I think, in the uh, one of the handouts, one of the links, um, there is a list of um, uh, plants that attract um, hummingbirds. Okay. And so they can refer to that. I think that's in there. Excellent. Um, have you ever heard of or used bamboo pots? I have never used them before. Okay, there was a question about that. Someone I can else research it. was concerned that uh, peat is a non-renewable resource mm -hmm. and should people be not using it or using an alternative? Yes, that's a really good question. It is a non-renewable resource and I would recommend to people who are very concerned about that, because it sure is um, something that we use a lot, um, is to use uh, coconut choir 
that you have to rehydrate. You can purchase it in pieces and you soak it in water and then you can do whatever you want to with it. Okie doke. There were several questions about the reuse of soil. Could you kind of go over that again and what you have to do if you're reusing your soil? Yes. And how to check if you're doing it right? Yeah, there's several issues. The biggest issue is, is um, the lack of nutrients because when you water your container, you're flushing out the nutrients every time. So you need to replace those nutrients. And one of the ways you can do that is to add compost to reused soil. And I've had luck, good luck, with reusing soil by putting in two thirds reused soil uh, and one third compost and mixing it together and uh, making my own little uh, brew of soil. And uh, that way you're bringing, you're adding the nutrients back to the soil. Okay, great. Um, there were also a lot of questions about the difference between a potting medium or potting soil and a soilless mix mm -hmm. and to use what? Could you go well, over that again? Yeah. First of all, the, um, the uh, vegetables would not be um, planted in soilless mix because it has no uh, bacteria in it. It has no soil in it. It's, it's sterile. And it's also uh, something you can use with annuals because it's light and you can add a few um, nutrients to it. But it loses nutrients because of its light weight. It loses nutrients very quickly. Um, potting soil comes with everything that you need. Um, and it provides more structure and support for roots. Soilless mixes aren't good about roots. Okay, great. Um, there was a question, are there any plants that you would never put together in a pot? Oh, yes. <laughs> I would. <laughs> the main rule of thumb is that you want to make sure that every plant you put in the same pot has the same cultural requirements, the same needs for soil, the same needs for water, the same needs for sun. Um, the reason is because that is going to make life easier for you as a gardener, and it'll also support the plant health of all the plants in there. So don't put a, a plant that loves shade in the same pot with a plant that loves sun, and a plant that doesn't want much water with a plant that does. Okay. Um, are there any plants that uh, don't like each other, I guess, was part of the question. <laughs> <sighs> I haven't talked with them yet. I don't know. <laughs> um, in, in terms of plants liking each other, I, I, I'm not sure I know how to answer that. I can only answer with what they need. Okay. Um, surely they wouldn't like each other if they don't, you know, enjoy the same uh, soil environment that you have created. And, um, uh, but, you know, I, I think knowing your plant is really important. And so sometimes we just arbitrarily see something pretty like lantana and we put it in a pot and then we stick other things in it because it's so small growing or whatever. And then those things don't do well. And it's probably not because they don't like each other but because they don't have the same need, you know. So that's, that's something that researching your plants is much better way to go and saves you money and time if you do that. Thank you. Um, someone else has a butt patch of mint in their ground that they want to move into a container. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any hints for them? Um, I say good. You're going to move it into a container because one of the problems with mint, obviously, is that it, is, it can be invasive. And so putting it into a, a pot is a good way to tame it and also cultivate it, you know. Um, I don't know what mint it is, but um, uh, I can certainly research uh, that information and find out the cultural requirements of mint. But um, I imagine it's just like most herbs, it either likes water or it does not. And so <laughs> we'll, ha we'll have to take a look at that. That would be the big issue to me is uh, knowing its water needs. Okay, thanks, Ann. Um, a couple of people mentioned that they had had good luck growing berries in containers. Mm -hmm. Are there any other fruits in our area that you would recommend for container gardening? 
Um, I haven't done much research on uh, berries, but I can certainly do that. I love doing research, so I can certainly do that and look at that question. Um, I, I think the same thing is that um, uh, I think you could truly have berries in a container because most plants, given the right conditions and ro proper care, will grow in containers. The whole issue is roots. You know, do they have shallow roots? Then you need this kind of container. Do they have medium roots? Then if you've got long, very, very deep roots, then you need a certain kind of container. So uh, it, those would be the issues that I would explore. Okay. Um, are there any care, uh, for when you have overwinter a plant and they become dormant, uh, are there any things you need to do for it, like water it or anything like that? I, I do water mine. I bring in a rubber tree plant and also a, a palm. And um, when they completely dry out, I water them, uh, soak them down. And this, ha I would say maybe twice a month, I do that. These are large plants, but you do need to water them occasionally. You don't want, especially if you have them inside where they don't have much sun, you want to be careful about contributing to root rot. Okay. Well, that's good, Anne. I think that covers most of the questions and the rest will be in the chat for okay. later. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Got you. Lots of nice comments. Oh, good. I'm glad. I felt I had to hurry through it, but um, there's a lot, as I said, and I want to repeat, the resource handout has so much detailed information that can't be covered in just 90 minutes. And I do wish people will check that out for lots of good ideas.